Sometime around 1505, a Frenchman by the name of François Tissard paid a visit to a synagogue in Ferrara. He described it in his Compendium of Jewish Rituals. I strongly desired to witness their rituals, to hear their singing, and to comprehend their mysteries. You could hear one man barking, another braying, and another bellowing. Such a cacophony of discordant sounds do they make. Weighing this with the rest of their rituals, I almost became nauseous. One hundred years later, the Englishman Thomas Coriat set out on a tour across the European continent. After his return in 1611, he published his impressions. The following is an excerpt from the chapter Observations of Venice, in which he describes the singing of a cantor in a synagogue. An exceeding loud yelling, undecent roaring, and as it were, a beastly bellowing of it forth. After that, such a confused and huddling manner that I think the hearers can very hardly understand him. Sometimes he cries out alone, and sometimes again, with others serving, as it were, his clerks hard without his seat, and within do roar with him, but so that his voice, which he straineth so high as if he sung for a wager, drowneth all the rest. Were Tissad and Coriat Jew haters? Perhaps. They had been taught that Christianity has superseded Judaism which was an inferior religion. Or perhaps Tissad and Coriat could simply not bridge the cultural gap. Jewish chanting, based on Middle Eastern styles, must have sounded so different from their experiences of church music. Renaissance polyphony and orderly plain chant, performed by professional singers and instrumentalists. Or perhaps these tourists were not biased. Perhaps the chanting in these synagogues really was hard on the ears, performed by untalented volunteers. But whatever the reason, these words must have wounded the progressive Jews of northern Italy. In the 16th century, many Jews had risen to positions of prominence and wealth as bankers, scholars, doctors, writers, actors, and musicians. The establishment of the ghetto in Venice in 1516 actually provided a rare opportunity for Jews to have a stable residence on the island itself. The gates of the ghetto were open during the day, and the Jews of Venice had many opportunities to interact with their Christian neighbors. They immersed themselves in Italian culture and aspired to achieve what Baldassare Castiglione called sprezzatura. The education of many Jewish children included the study of Renaissance art and music, as well as classic and contemporary literature in Italian and Latin. And the ideal spokesman for these bicultural Jews was Rabbi Leon Modena. Mi chiamo Leon Modena. Rabbi Leon Modena, Yehuda Arye, was one of the most colorful figures in the Jewish Renaissance. Born in Venice, he traveled extensively among the various cities in the region. He made his living teaching and preaching in synagogues, schools, and private homes, composing poems on commission for various noblemen, and as an assistant printer. In addition, he acquired and lost considerable sums gambling in various games of chance. He was an accomplished musician and served as cantor in the Italian synagogue in Venice. He was also a talented composer and conductor. 
In 1628, he became director of Venice's Accademia degli Impediti, an ensemble of musicians in the Jewish ghetto. In 1622, Modena wrote, Will we, who used to be masters of the art of music in our prayers and praises, now become objects of scorn among the nations? Shall they say that we are no longer masters of this art of music, and that we cry out to the God of our fathers like dogs and crows? Clearly he was aware of non-Jewish critics like Tisaud and Koryat comparing synagogue music to animal sounds. Modena acknowledged the degraded state of synagogue music in his own time, but indicated that it was not always so. In former times, wise men in all fields of learning flourished in Israel. All noble disciplines sprang from them, and so people honored them and held them in such high esteem that they were soaring as if on eagles' wings. Music was not missing among these disciplines. The Jews possessed music in all its perfection, and others learned it from them. However, when it became their fate to dwell among strangers and wander to distant lands where they were dispersed among foreign peoples, it caused them to forget all their knowledge and to lose all wisdom. Modena set out on a campaign to reform synagogue music, to make it more consonant with that of his Christian neighbors. Well, the Christians of Italy saw their Renaissance as a reawakening of culture after the dark ages of the previous centuries. Rabbi Leon Modena turned to his friend, the musician Salomone Rossi, to herald the Jewish reawakening, reviving the glories of the ancient past. Modena wrote, And now, O congregation of the faithful, you are blessed in that we have been favored with such an excellent new beginning. For there has arisen in Israel, thank God, another Solomon, a very talented man who often performs with singers before princes, dukes, and nobles. After the splendor of the Jewish people had been dimmed by the passage of days and years, he restored the crown of music to its ancient state, as in the days of the Levites on their stages. He set the words of the Psalms to music that was published, joyous songs before the ark, on Sabbaths, feasts, and festivals. No longer will arrogant opponents say harsh words about the Jewish people they will see that it too possesses great talent, the equal of the best endowed. Rossi's synagogue music represented a huge innovation. To our knowledge, it was the first time the Hebrew synagogue liturgy had ever been set as polyphonic choral music. Now, aside from the Hebrew lyrics, it doesn't sound at all that different from church music of its time. There was bound to be a conflict between the modern Jews, who had been influenced by the Italian Renaissance, who supported this innovation, and those with a more conservative theology and praxis. In 1605, there was an incident in a synagogue in Ferrara. Let's hear about it in the words of Rabbi Modena. We have six or eight knowledgeable men who know something about the art of song, by which I mean polyphonic music, men of our congregation, may their rock keep and save them, who on holidays and festivals raise their voices in the synagogue and joyfully sing songs, praises, hymns, and melodies such as Enkelohenu, Aleinu Lishabeach, Yigdal, Adon Olam, and so forth, to the glory of the Lord, in an orderly relationship of the voices, according to this art, polyphonic music. 
Now a man stood up to drive them out with his speech, answering those who enjoyed the music, saying that it is not proper to do this, for rejoicing is forbidden, song is forbidden, and hymns set to artful music have been forbidden since the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Why such a violent reaction? For centuries, Jews in the diaspora, by and large, had followed the instructions of community leaders who tried to ensure that the people would maintain their unique cultural and religious identity. They cited these proof texts. You shall not copy the practices of the land of Egypt where you dwelt, or of the land of Canaan to which I am taking you, nor shall you follow their ritual laws. And Rejoice not, O Israel, as other nations do. Throughout the European diaspora, Jews constituted only a tiny minority, subject to the temptations of acculturation and to pressure from their Christian hosts to abandon their religion. For the rabbis, maintaining a unique identity included shunning the music of their non-Jewish neighbors. Furthermore, the rabbis forbade almost all joyous music. Musical instruments were associated with dancing and drinking and partying, and Jews were told that as long as they were in exile, they were in a state of mourning. No music. The great philosopher Moses Maimonides stressed the historical reasons for Jews refraining from music. The rabbis at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple prohibited playing musical instruments, singing songs, and making any sound resembling song. It is forbidden to have any pleasure therein, and it is forbidden to listen to them because of the destruction of the temple. But Rabbi Modena defended the new musical practice. In a lengthy responsum, included as a preface in Rossi's publication, he pointed out that the early rabbinic authorities intended to censor music at drunken parties. They had no problem with music in the synagogue. Who does not know that all authorities agree that all forms of singing are completely permissible in connection with the observance of the ritual commandments? Where there is no suggestion of secular merrymaking, no carousing, and no royal pomp, Vocal music is permitted. I do not see how anyone with a brain in his skull could have any doubt that it is proper to praise God in song, in the synagogue, on special Sabbaths and on festivals. And here, Modena specifically defends choral singing. The cantor is urged to chant his prayers in a most pleasant voice. If he were able to make his one voice sound like ten singers, wouldn't that be a good thing? And here Modena argues for the value of beauty. It is written in the book of Proverbs, Honor the Lord with your riches. And our sages of blessed memory interpret this as meaning with the rich talent God has given you. How is this? If your voice is sweet, Go before the ark to chant the prayers. If this is true, because the Lord has bestowed these men with the talent to master the art of polyphonic music, and they use it for God's glory, should we consider them to be sinners? For if that is the case, then cantors might as well just hee-haw like donkeys and not sing sweetly. Note the reference again to the opinion of the non-Jewish critics who thought synagogue soundscape sounded like animals. Modena concludes, No intelligent person, no scholar, ever thought of prohibiting the use of the greatest possible beauty of voice in praising the blessed Lord, or to prohibit the use of musical art that awakens the soul to God's glory. But what about the objection that Rossi was abandoning the Jewish modes, introducing into the synagogue music that was modern, that was outside of the tradition, that was based on European Christian liturgical music and secular music? 
the Italian rabbi Samuel ben Alchanan Archivolti, had written, How can we justify the actions of a few cantors of our day who chant the holy prayers to the tunes of popular secular songs? The practice of using non-Jewish melodies in the synagogue was a matter of no little controversy, and it actually still is. Rossi conceived of his synagogue music more or less in the model of polyphonic church motets. He also borrowed freely from the techniques of popular secular music, with which he was well acquainted since his day job was providing musical entertainment at the Mantuan court of the Gonzagas. Rossi was clearly influenced by the music of his colleagues at the court. One of them, Giovanni Gastoldi, was the composer of a collection of dances that was the bestseller of its kind, his Balletti a Cinque Voci, dance music for five voices, published in Venice in 1591. Rossi borrowed the style of the balletto for his joyous treatment of the Kaddish, a doxology praising God that is found in every Jewish service. Like many balletti, this Kaddish is in a swinging triple meter and is strophic. That is, we hear the same music repeated over and over. Here is Rossi's setting of the Kaddish for five voices. Thank you. 
Modena defended the incorporation of the styles of popular dance music into the synagogue by emphasizing the positive intent of Rossi's actions. Offering his powers to his God, he took from the secular that he might add to the sacred, honoring his divine benefactor using the talent that God had bestowed on him. Thus, Modena had to defend Jewish music not just on one front, but on two. Modena and Rossi were battling the conservative elements in the Jewish community. Modena's essay, which appeared in Rossi's publication, was an attempt to silence the criticisms of those whom he called the overpious souls and misguided hearts. But Modena was also sensitive to the criticisms heard from non-Jewish sources. In promoting Rossi's synagogue polyphony, Modena's goal was to counter the impression that Jewish music was second-rate. He worked not only to create a renaissance of Jewish music, but also to raise the status of Jews in the eyes of the neighboring Christian community. Yeah.